And of course, our website at cwihp.si.edu. All of our documents are on this website. We host a small fellowship program for younger scholars from former communist world countries. And we also hold meetings, international meetings in at times exotic places like Mongolia, like this past March, but also here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Meetings which feature new findings, new sources, important new publications such as the one we're talking about today, Treasonable Doubt, the Harry Dexter White Spy Case by Bruce Craig. The book, which incidentally is available for sale outside, um, and today's presentations concern the ongoing debate about how much new evidence from the about how much new evidence from the former communist world and new American sources shed light on the truth behind accusations in 1948 by self-confessed Soviet agents Whitaker Chambers and Elizabeth Bentley that key government officials in the administrations of Franklin D. Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman were communist sympathizers or saboteurs. The most notorious of these cases has, of course, been, the most famous one has been that of Alger Hiss, a former State Department official who accompanied FDR to the famous February 1945 Yalta Conference and in 1948 was president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The accusations echoed later by Wisconsin Senator Joe McCarthy and his investigation raised the specter of a giant communist conspiracy of a pervasive infestation of the Roosevelt and Truman administrations with communists, traitors, and red agents. In the wake of the Hiss case, historians have debated the significance of the communist threat, especially the one posed by espionage in US government agencies. This debate over his, of course, tied in, ties in with that over atomic espionage involving key American scientists working in and around the Manhattan Project charged with developing the atomic bomb. Much has been established, much has been published in recent years. The debate is fierce, the debate is fierce, and no doubt to today's discussion um, uh, may be fears. Less well known at the time and even today is the case of Dr. Harry Dexter White, who, as Bruce Craig has put it, of all those named by Chambers and Bentley as having had communist ties, as former assistant secretary of the Treasury, one of Treasury Secretary's um, Henry Morgenthau's most trusted advisors and with John Maynard Keynes, co-author of the Bretton Woods Agreements, White was perhaps the most influential of them all. White forcefully defended himself against the accusations leveled against him before the House Committee on Un-American Activities in 1948, but died within days at his home in New Hampshire. Ever since, the case has been shrouded in mystery. Well, I think we will hear about the particular of this case today. I hope this discussion today can go beyond the narrow issue of whether White was a communist sympathizer, saboteur, or spy, whether he was innocent or not, to address the meaning of the White case for the broader historical context of the time. <coughs> How was it possible, as Bruce has put it, <coughs> that someone like Harry Dexter White, co-founder of the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund, and so forth, as capitalist an institution as ever devised, could have had sympathy for the communist movement and the, Sov and the Soviet Union, if he did indeed? What does the White story tell us about the politics and the society of the New Deal? 
Now we have three distinguished panelists with us today to discuss this new book and the case and the context at large. To my immediate right, of course, is, if you want the guest, the speaker of honor, author of um, Treasonable Doubt, Bruce Craig. Dr. Craig is the director of the National Coalition for History, a Washington, D.C.-based advocacy organization that represents the historical and archival community on Capitol Hill. He received his PhD from American University in 1999 and has authored numerous scholarly and popular articles and is known to many of you through his NCH Washington Update, a widely read and highly regarded um, newsletter in historical and archival circles. Treasonable Doubt, the Harry Dexter White spy case is his first book. He's currently working on a screen adaptation of the Russian literary classic Faithful Ruslan and, of, and on a biography of Alger Hiss. There's more on Dr. Craig in the biographical material um, in front of you. We have two distinguished commentaries, commentators today. First, Kai Bird to my immediate left, a biographer currently under contract with um, Alfred Knopf and Simon & Schuster <coughs> for a co-authored biography forthcoming next year, J. Robert Oppenheimer, An American Life. He is also the author of the critically acclaimed biography, The Chairman, John J. McCloy, The Making of the American Establishment, as well as The Color of Truth, <coughs> Mac George and William Bundy's William Bundy, Brothers in Arms, published in 1998. He has published widely both in uh, scholarly journals such as Diplomatic History as well as um, newspapers from the New York Times to the, to the LA Times. He's the recipient of a number of fellowships too many to mention. Let me just say um, a MacArthur. He's the winner of a MacArthur Writing Fellowship and, of course, a former Wilson, Woodrow Wilson Center Fellow. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you back, Kai. To my um, far left is our second commentator, Dr. James Bowden, historian of the International Monetary Fund, one of the institutions that White, uh, in the establishment of which White was involved. He holds a PhD in economics from Duke University. Before join, joining the IMF in 1981, he was professor of economics <coughs> at Indiana University and had served as an economist at the OECD in Paris. He also has a number of publications to his credit, in fact, has written several articles on Harry Dexter White. Uh, most recently, Politics and the Attack on FDR's econ Economists from the Grand Alliance to the Cold War, published in Intelligence and National Security last fall. And his latest book is Silent Revolution, the history, a history of the IMF from 1979 to 1989. He's currently working on a sequel. Let me just uh, mention, I was asked to mention briefly that uh, if you're interested in um, uh, espionage history, there's uh, yet another event tonight that you can treat yourself to over at the Spy Museum. Uh, Nigel West will be speaking on the greatest theft in history, Soviet penetration of the Manhattan Project. Uh, I think you will get a slightly different view, um, slightly different perspective on these events at that event. Um, without further ado, then, let me turn it over to our speakers. Dr. Craig will talk for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Commentators each, 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'd like to turn it over uh, to you for discussion, for commentaries and questions. Thank you. It certainly is a pleasure to have this book launch here at the Wilson Center. And I wish to thank um, all the people at the, here at the center for making this possible, uh, Christian in, in particular. 
and also to thank my two colleagues, Kai Bird and Jim Botton, for agreeing to comment on this book. I've known both of them for quite some time. Kai and I first started talking about this about three years ago, I guess, is when we sort of shared an interest in espionage, and I didn't know very much about Oppenheimer, and he didn't know all that much about Harry Dexter White, but we started to talk at that time. And then Jim Botton and I go back a long way, perhaps very close to the inception of this project. Um, uh, because of Harry Dexter White's uh, role uh, in terms of the, the founding of, of the IMF. I'd like to talk about, um, for about 20, 25 minutes or so before turning to the commentators um, and also to field some of the questions that some of you might have, I want to talk basically about four items. First of all, the inception of this project, then a little bit about the background on Harry Dexter White, who he was and why he is important. Um, talk a little bit about what I've tried to do in this book and what this book specifically addresses. And finally, uh, wrap up with some speculations on why this book uh, is ending up being so controversial. Uh, first off, in terms of the inception of this project, the origin, of course, goes back to the Hiss case. Back in 1988, Donald Hodel, as Secretary of the Interior, designated the Whitaker Chambers pumpkin patch as a national historic landmark. And I was working for a uh, a, a preservation group at that time and entered into the fray and came in to do battle with a Reagan speechwriter, a man who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, Anthony Dolan, one of Reagan's truly fine speechwriters. And uh, we were then uh, pitted against one another on national public radio. And uh, we sort of battled out about talking about the pumpkin patch. But then right after that, right after that discussion, there was an interview with Alger Hiss, who gave one of the very rare uh, interviews that he gave on his book, Recollections of a Life. And I remember in his very shaky voice, he said, it wasn't me that Hueck was after as much it was Harry Dexter White. Now, I had heard of Alger Hiss, but who is this guy, Harry Dexter White? And this basically began a decade-long search to get to the bottom of who is Harry Dexter White. Who is Harry Dexter White, and why is the Cold War espionage case of such significance? The answer to the first question, I think, is really pretty straightforward. In a thumbnail sketch, Harry Dexter White was the youngest of some seven children. By virtue of his birth order, Frank Sullaway, in his controversial book called Born to Rebel, would suggest that White, because he was the youngest male sibling, possessed characteristics of an individual destined to become a radical innovator. Indeed, early on, White demonstrated strong social consciousness, and like future Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau and Harry Dexter White's good friend, he was involved in the Settlement House movement. White attended schools in Boston, then enrolled in Columbia University, where he attended college at the same time that his future accuser, Whitaker Chambers, attended. Interestingly, though, there's no evidence that either man had any contact with one another, although it would have been hard not to have heard of Whitaker Chambers in terms of the controversy that was generated at Columbia over his uh, play for puppets. White then went on, went on to Harvard University, where he earned a doctorate in economics. His dissertation on the French international accounts earned him the Wells Prize over his friendly rival and longtime friend, another accused Soviet spy, Lachlan Curry. Now, because he was a Jew and not able to land a permanent position at the waspy bastion of Harvard University, he accepted a teaching position at Lawrence College in Appleton, Wisconsin, hometown of the future Senator Joseph McCarthy. There is no evidence that McCarthy was a student of Harry Dexter White. <laughs> in late 1933, White accepted an invitation of Jacob Viner to undertake a four-month special study, a comprehensive assessment of monetary and banking legislation and institutions with a long-term goal of planning a new legislative program for the Roosevelt administration. Once he came to Washington and became a member of the Treasury Economics Brain Trust, White would never return to Appleton. In June 1934, he accepted an appointment with the Treasury as a special economic analyst in the Division of Research Statistics and eventually rose to the position of, a secre of Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. While at the Treasury, White first became involved in what I term, in treasonable doubt, a species of espionage. It was late in 1934 or 1935 that White first came in contact with a communist underground courier, a moon-faced man who gained fame in the infamous Alger Hiss case, Whitaker Chambers, author of the novel work, Witness. White is the highest ranking figure in the Roosevelt and Truman administrations ever to be accused of espionage. 
For nearly a decade, including throughout World War II, White and his brilliant staff, that at one time included legendary economists who worked directly or indirectly under White, Herbert Stein, John Kenneth Galbraith, Edward Bernstein, mapped out the Treasury fiscal, uh, fiscal policy and to a certain extent, to the irritation of Secretary of State Cordell, Cordell Hall, foreign policy as well. It was because of White's, of Morgenthau's closeness to Franklin Delano Roosevelt that the Treasury ranked second in power uh, to the state and Treasury assumed new powers and authority that had never been concentrated in one department before. His staff, which included a goodly number of what I term in treasonable doubt, the e-communists. These are economists with what today we would characterize as strong progressive, if not radical, proclivities and inclination. A handful, perhaps 14 out of a total staff of 400 who at one time or another worked for White, had flirted with the communist movement and few, there were fewer though than, than uh, 14 who were open or secret communists. Men like George Silverman, Lud Ullman, and the master figure of all, Nathan Gregory Silvermaster, the central individual in the Soviet-directed CPUSA information gathering network. White perhaps is best remembered though as the co-founder of the United Nations Twin Financial Institutions and World Bank, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. After he retired from federal service, White was named by another uh, former courier, uh, somebody by her own admission that had never met White, Elizabeth Bentley. Um, as uh, she maintained that White was a central figure in what she termed not an, necessarily an information gathering ring but rather an espionage ring and Whitaker Chambers corroborated her story. And White, as a result, asked to appear before HUAC to deny the charges. I have a brief reading from the book. This is on page six. In 1948, White no longer served in government, nor was he very good, in very good health. Yet, when called to testify, the short, heavyset man with rimmed glasses and mustache strode up to the witness table, raised his hand, and swore to tell nothing but the truth. Basking in the bright newsreel camera lights, White confronted Huack and boldly refuted the accusations made by Bentley and Chambers. When his inquisitors fired questions in him, White snapped back answers. He never hedged, but adroitly and often humorously responded to every question addressed to him, and he put Huack on the defensive. Then, after vigorously denouncing his accusers, he fished out a scrap of paper from his coat pocket and fervent, fer fervently recited his American creed one of the most eloquent statements of New Deal liberalism ever delivered. He said, I believe in freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of the press, freedom of criticism, and freedom of movement. I believe in the goal of equality of opportunity and the right of each individual to follow the calling of his or her own choice, and the right of every individual to an opportunity to develop his or her capacity to the fullest. I consider these principles sacred. I regard them as the basic fabric of our American way of life, and I believe them as basic to the fab I believe in them as living realities and not mere words on paper. That is my creed. When White finished speaking, the room erupted in spontaneous and to the dismay of Huack, prolonged applause. Now after the hearing though, White boarded a train at Union Station and embarked on the first leg of his return trip to Blueberry Hill, his recently acquired house in Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire. Three days later though, he was dead. White appeared to have died of natural causes, and consequently no, uh, no autopsy was performed. But given the deep suspicion of the Soviet Union and the near universal belief that the threat posed by red agents was real, the press, upon hearing of White's ultimate demise, did not hesitate to give credence to rumors that Soviet agents had murdered White in order to silence him. A few thought he had committed suicide, and others, including a number of partisan press reporters, concluded that the stress on his heart by his HUAC appearance made him yet another victim, quote, victim of a special sort of tyranny by the Committee on Un-American Activities. To answer the second question that I posed a few moments ago, why is the Harry Dexter White espionage case of importance, perhaps we should keep in mind the words of English historian Frederick William Maitland, who said, events now in the past were once far in the future. Now this last week I saw the most recent Brad Pitt movie called Troy, a pathetic makeover of a great poetic work by Greek poets, tragedists, and historians, but still it did show 
that little seems to change in history from ancient times to modern times because we are human and we share with the ancients human frailties and tendencies, including a lust for power and glory, a propensity to go to war to satisfy a nation's lust for power and also for territory. Like the world of Homer, the world of the 1930s was a time of tyrants, a world of wars and rumors of war, of worldwide depression caused by the inherent structural flaws of capitalism. As in every other time of social and political upheaval, it was a time of plots, of conspiracies, of assassinations, and of secret agents. It was also an era where the American radical right sent out a clarion call warning of the international communist menace and that the Trojan horse in America was creeping socialism. For many on the right, Rooseveltian internationalism, a world in which a grand alliance would exist, in which there was no disconnect between having American democracy, Soviet-style communism, and British neo-imperialism coexist in order to cooperate and ensure that the post-World War II era would be an era of lasting peace. But the 1930s was also an era of idealism. For some of the brightest young Americans, they saw in American-style communism, not necessarily Stalinism, I mean, a new day dawning and looked to new possibilities with a framework of Marxist historical inevitability. In the words of American aristocrat turncoat Frederick Field, our goal was to achieve profound and lasting changes to the resolution of the domestic economic social crisis and align American foreign policy to serve the needs of the plain people of the world instead of their oppressors. Some turned to communism, others like Harry Dexter White flirted with these ideals but ultimately saw the nation's salvation in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal and Rooseveltian, Rooseveltian internationalism. Parenthetically, while researching this book, I found a wonderful quote that I'll share with you that I think expresses the spirit of the age by none other than the famed Cambridge spy, Donald MacLean, who in 1935 told the British foreign ministry officials who were interviewing him for a position, at one time I did share the ideals of communism, nor was I the only one. I would add, however, that I haven't entirely shed those ideals, but I'm working on it. It was also an, an era of moral dilemmas and moral absolutes. Christians in Nazi Germany, for example, had to choose between working toward the defeat of their nation in order to see Christian civilization survive or pray for the victory of their nation and thereby destroy all civilization. Each German Christian had to decide which entity deserved their fealty, loyalty to a nation state or loyalty to higher ideals. It raises the question that I hope will cause readers of treasonable doubt to ponder, and that question is found in the last line of the book, Graham Greene's famous admonition, who among us has not committed treason to something or something more important than a country? What I've tried to do in this book is create, in essence, a snapshot of the past. Um, to a certain extent, history if history is a snapshot to the past, biography is like a camera. The subject, in this case, Harry Dexter White, remains the same, but the angle of shot taken by the director, or in this case the author, sharpens the interpretation. Depending on one's filters, we can see Harry Dexter White as a person draped in the colors of American loyalty, red, white, and blue, as his daughters to this day see him. Or we can use a pink or a red filter, and as a result, we get a very different portrait. Revisionist historians of the right have been harsh on Harriet Dexter White. Herbert Romerstein, Eric Brendel, for example, in their books rehash the old historiography framework largely on uh, sometime questionable testimony of Elizabeth Bentley and others who boldly proclaim White's guilt. Basing their conclusions on the testimony of, ben of Bentley, Chambers, and others, other historians, John Haynes and Harvey Clare, have been more nuanced and have moved beyond Bentley and Chambers and take into consideration a handful of references to White in a fragmentary series of intercepts and transmissions known as the Venona documents. In general, though, I have taken a generally more skeptical view of the evidence and do not ascribe to what some have termed prosecutor prosecutorial history. I believe it is the historian's duty to raise doubts about specific allegations and know that you cannot prove innocence. But if the evidence is there, and in this case, I think it is. The key to Harry Dexter White's thinking, one can explain motivation and come to understand what White was doing by cooperating with and at times co-opting 
Soviet intelligence and political officials to achieve what in his arrogance were his larger objectives. What this book does, it is not a full-fledged biography. For that, you might want to take a look at David Rees' 1973 book, Harry Dexter White, A Study in Paradox, Paradox, a dated but otherwise still very fine biography. It is not a comprehensive assessment of Harry Dexter White's philosophy or economic programs. For the latter, I would refer you to Jim Botton's forthcoming journal of economic thought article, New Light on Harry Dexter White, in which Jim focuses on Dr. White's contributions to economic policy and institutions. What this book is, though, is a sketch of White's early life, his war record, schooling, and then focuses on his responsibilities within the Treasury Department and IMF from 1935 to 1948. Most importantly, by plowing through dozens of archival collections, scores of dubious, often self-serving memoirs and oral interviews, through use of FOIA, through forcing open grand jury minutes of the Hiss case and the Venona decrypts, I assess the allegations of Whitaker Chambers and Elizabeth Bentley, including their assertions that White was an agent of influence who prejudiced American policy to pro-Soviet positions. <coughs> Personally, I think the assessment of the allegations of policy for subversion is central to the contribution, is, is the central contribution that this, make, this book makes to scholarship. Of the German occupation currency scandal, even the conservative rag, the Washington Times reviewer, was forced to admit Craig's main achievement is his debunking of the claim that Bentley made years after her initial interviews with the FBI that White was instrumental in shipping printing plates for German occupation currency to the Soviets. By the time she made this charge, Bentley was a pathetic figure who had lost her moment in time, a souse and a sleepabout who had made life miserable for her FBI handlers. Craig convincingly demonstrates that the currency plate story was concocted by a Bentley ghostwriter. The Morgenthau Plan for Germany. Washington Post reviewer, the mercurial Ted Morgan claims that I unconvincingly challenged the eyewitness account of publicist Fred Smith and that White hatched the plan after all. Contrary to Morgan's myopic view of the evidence and blind acceptance of one sideline participant over the documentary, the overwhelming documentary evidence at hand, I came to the same conclusion as Secretary Morgenthau himself came to and repeatedly declared that the Morgenthau plan sprung from his heart and mind and that it was he, not Harry Dexter White, who was the architect and master builder of the plan. As I conclude, the plan was inspired by Henry Morgenthau, fashioned by Harry Dexter White's insightful insights and shaped and molded by the analytical abilities of a team of highly competent technical experts inside the treasury. Of the allegations of precipitating the fall of China through manipulating the price of gold, no reviewer has yet tackled this one. But in the chapter, I think it, I point out the proper perspective that the role that the Treasury agents in China, particularly Manuel Fox and Saul Adler, played in their efforts to advance U.S. interests in the Far East before, during, and after World War II. China was not lost owing to the actions or inactions of Harriet Extra White as much as it was lost by that nation's own corrupt and brutal leaders who failed to capture the hearts and minds of the Chinese people. The actions of Treasury officials in 1944 and 1945 hardly precipitated the collapse of the national regime in 1948 and 1949. The effort to subvert UN institutions to serve the cause of international co communism will hear again the contention that Harry Dexter White devised the Bretton Woods internationalist institutions along with loans and credits to the Soviet Union to advance the communist cause is pure, utter nonsense. What this chapter does show is the degree to which White was willing to use back channels, including the NKVD, to achieve his experts, to achieve his objectives and those of John Maynard Keynes for post-war financial stability. And then I switch in the book to focus on the five decades, decade search for corroboration, including the story of Herbert Brunel, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Harry S. Truman, the so-called Harry Dexter White controversy in which Brunel is accused of appointing Harry Dexter White to the IMF knowing that he is, um, uh, knowing that he was a Soviet spy. I might point out one thing, well, back here, um, I also take a look at the Venona documents and one of the contributions that this book has is the, identify, the identification of the mysterious figure known as Kolstov. This is Kolstov. This is Harry Dexter White. Uh, 
uh, one of the things that I think becomes interesting in terms of, oops, wrong way. In terms of this book is some of the information that I was able to gather from the FBI over a period of nine years. This is the first memo that I got relating to Kolstoff from the FBI, a typical FBI redacted document. <laughs> nine years later, this is what I got. And this seven-page memorandum is uh, reproduced in, in the book and identifies uh, the person as known as Kolstoff as N.F. Chiklokian. Deputy Prime Minister, Deputy President of the State Bank who attended the Bretton Woods Institution. It is certainly true, though, that the Venona document, this document in particular, is the smoking gun memo which points to White's complicity in the Soviet underground, the famous Kolstaff Memorandum. I draw your attention to two lines in this. You probably can't see it down at the very <coughs> bottom. But at the bottom of this memorandum, Kolstaff says, he, White, proposes infrequent conversations lasting up to half an hour while driving in his automobile. This relates to what is known as, um, as trade craft. Well, one of the documents that I found that basically corroborates this is independent information coming from the first interview that Whitaker Chambers made with the FBI in which we find these words. Chambers said that he has always met Harry Dexter White in Washington and insisted upon having meetings in the vicinity of his home. Many of these meetings were in front of the theater in the vicinity of the Horde Way and Connecticut Avenue Northwest. Key language. Other times he would meet White and White would drive him around in his automobile during which time White would furnish Chambers information he had written on pieces of paper and sometimes oral information emanating from the Treasury Department. This is independent corroboration of what the Kolstaff memo says with respect to the tradecraft that Harriet Extra White uh, uh, followed. In the final chapter, the most controversial chapter, I summarize and conclude that White was involved in a species of espionage. Um, this final chapter is certainly the most controversial one in the book. It's been the focus of critical reviews by the right-wing press. Uh, the dissertation version of this, and hence, uh, this book, I would imagine, is, as well, has been erroneously characterized by revisionists of the rights, Haynes and Clare in, in denial, as the most sophisticated and detailed effort to justify Soviet espionage ever written. Unfortunately, I think these critics confuse my personal beliefs with those that I believe were White's beliefs. I am not excusing or justifying anything. I am just explaining what I see in the evidence as Harry Dexter White's explanation of what he was seeking to do to support the grand cause of U.S.-Soviet cooperation in the post-war world and to explain what motivated him to do what he did to advance Rooseveltian internationalism. And finally, in the closing paragraphs, I take issue with the standards of proof and best evidence that partisan journalists and some historians have applied and challenge the profession to use a far more rigorous standard when assessing the evidence, uh, assessing the evidence relating to accused subversives. There is no doubt that Treasonable Dad is a controversial work, and thus far it has been slammed by the right-wing press and largely ignored by the left. Why? I think it is because it is disconcerting to each polarized side for opposite reasons. It is not sat satisfying to the left, as I do not find that Harry Dexter White was an innocent and it is slammed by the right because I supposedly justify, I would say explain, White's motivation, which, given the context of times, uh, he was able to justify. And I think the premise of this book, with respect to the nature of treason and loyalty, is disconcerting even to moderates in this era of new nationalism and patriotism. The words of E.M. Forrester, I think, made government officials uncomfortable in 1938 and I wager they still do today. If I had to choose between betraying my friends and my country, I pray that I have the guts to betray my country. Thanks. Thank you. I know there are many different perspectives on this, and I'd like to bring those out in the discussion. So with uh, that caution, I'd like to turn it over to uh, our two uh, commentators. Um, very good uh, for um, about 10 minutes. Okay. So we can get right to the discussion. Great. Thanks, Christian. I'm 
Um, I was wondering why Christian put me over here on the far left, but I guess I can be comfortable in the notion that to everybody else in the room, I'm sitting on the far right. So um, you know, I'll leave it to you to decide where I'm really sitting here. Uh, I, I, I should start with a couple of words about my own uh, background and perspective on this issue. As Bruce noted, uh, we first started discussing these matters about 10 years ago when we were we're both setting out, and I, I can guarantee you 10 years ago you could not have found this many people in the, in the entire world who would have uh, come to a discussion about Harry Dexter White. It's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a far more, for a hotter topic now than, than it was then. But I was primarily interested in White as an economist because I was uh, the historian. I had just recently taken on the responsibility of being the historian of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, at that time, White had uh, been in a kind of semi-pariah status within the fund ever since the McCarthy era. Uh, as Bruce points out in his book, there was a, uh, a bust that had been sculpted of, actually a pair of busts of, of Keynes, uh, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White that had been sculpted in the late 40s, early 50s to honor the two main founding fathers of the institution. And after the McCarthy era, both busts had been placed in a, in a basement storage room. And, uh, but um, uh, yes, they both were placed in the basement. Uh, and there's a long story about that that I don't have time to go into now. But, um, but uh, Stan Fisher, who had just become uh, the first deputy managing director of the IMF, was, uh, was interested in the case of Harry Dexter White and asked me to, uh, to look into it and see what, what could actually be learned about the facts of the case. And so, so I started off on what start, seemed initially to be a uh, devoting a few weeks to a, to a topic that has uh, since occupied quite a bit more time than that. And I've, I've actually now, uh, I've written five articles on White that have been published in various journals, two on the espionage charges, uh, including the one that Christian mentioned at the outset, two assessing White's contributions as an economist, and one just kind of a general summary of his life that was written on the 50th anniversary of his death. So I, th I think um, I think I can say with some confidence that Bruce and I probably know more about Harry Dexter White than, than, uh, than almost anybody else. But we start from different perspectives, and, and I, because I was interested in him primarily as an economist, um, and, I, and I, I, I also would like to say at the outset that I, I start and I continue to act in, in all of my thinking about White from a presumption of innocence. I mean, that seems to me to be the right way to think about anybody's situation. Uh, and it sits well with kind of a general skepticism about the, uh, the, the about what most of what's been written about the man, um, and, and so I don't see our job as historians to be to try to prove anybody's innocence. I think it's uh, the burden of proof, in my view, lies lies elsewhere. And 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 the question is, can we find uh, you know plausible, sustainable, clear explanations of of events?